Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1220, Calculus 2 at, for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I will be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture 19, we'll be starting, well, we'll, we'll talk about the idea of improper integrals. And this can be found in section 7.8 of James Stewart's calculus textbook here. And so what does it mean for an integral to be improper? So imagine we have some continuous function f. And we're interested in integrals of the following form. Let's find the area under the curve from some fixed finite value a, but we go off towards infinity, right? Um, and so visually, we're thinking of something like the following. We have our function. Maybe it does something like this. And maybe the, because the function's asymptotic to the x-axis, we might be interested, well, if we allow this region to go off towards infinity, could it be possible that this is a finite area? A finite area? Well, it turns out with the right function, it can be, and sometimes it's not, right? Uh, and so what we mean here is we take the integral from a to infinity. Really, this is a limit calculation. Whenever you do, a, whenever you're working with infinity, really we're taking a limit of some kind. We're taking the limit as the upper bound of the integral goes off towards infinity. And so that's what a to, a to the infinity means for an integral. Similarly, we can define the integral from negative infinity to b, right? Again, we're gonna, this really is just shorthand for a limit. Take the limit as the lower bound a goes towards negative infinity, and we compute that right there. In some situations, we actually want a double infinity, right? Uh, we could have a situation of a graph. Maybe it looks something like the following. It's asymptotic on the right to the x-axis. It's asymptotic on the left. So this is sort of like your standard bell curve you see in statistics and probability. Could the area under the entire function be finite? Well, in the case of the normal distribution, the area under the curve is equal to one. Um, and so in this situation, if you're going from negative infinity to infinity, what you do is you just break this up into two, inter two integrals themselves. You go from negative infinity to C, which is defined by this rule. And then you also take the integral from c to infinity, which is defined by this rule right here. And typically you take c to be zero because that's a good, a good simple choice, but it could be any number you want to. And so these are examples of improper integrals. Now as improper integrals are defined using limits, if this limit exists, we say that the integral is convergent. Now if this limit does not exist, which also includes like maybe the limit does not exist, or if the limit itself is infinity, we'd still say the limit doesn't exist because infinity is not a real number. Um, then we say that the improper integral is divergent. So you'll hear this language, the function or the integral is convergent or divergent. Now this is describing the integral, not the function themselves. The function might converge towards the x-axis like you see in this picture right here, but the area of the curve could still be infinite and therefore the integral is divergent. Let's see some examples of such a such things, right? So let's take the integral from one to infinity of x to the negative three halves over uh, the negative three halves power. Now, by definition, an improper integral is the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral one to b um, x to negative three halves here. The reason why we put so much emphasis on the limit here is that the fundamental theorem of calculus does not apply in this setting where you're going off towards infinity. The the fundamental theorem of calculus only applies to proper integrals for which this is right here now a proper integral um, because b is a finite number it gets bigger 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 but it's a finite number the fundamental theorem of calculus applies here now this is a subtlety that's sometimes lost on beginners to calculus but it, it is an important an important distinction here we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus in this setting right for which as an antiderivative, we're gonna raise the power of x by one, so it becomes negative one half. We divide by negative one half, which of course is just the same thing this time by negative two, and we're gonna evaluate from one to b. So we end up with the limit as x approaches, or sorry, as b approaches infinity of negative two x to the negative one half power. And I'm actually gonna write this as negative two over the square root of x as you go from one to b here. And so when you when you plug these, notice there's a negative sign, so I'm gonna switch the order. So we get the limit as b goes to infinity of two over the square root of x as you go from b to one. 
And so then this will look like, because when you plug in the one, you're gonna get two over the square root of one. You don't need a limit for that. You're gonna subtract the limit as b goes to infinity of two over the square root of b right here. And so now calculating that limit there, uh, two, square root of one is one, two over one is two, so you get two minus, well, you're gonna get something that looks like two over the square root of infinity. Now, some people will get really scared right now because doing arithmetic with infinity is, is sort of the mathematical equivalent of doing black magic, right? You know, if we had a chemistry professor that was teaching us alchemy um, in our chemistry labs, we'd be really concerned about that. Well, this is sort of like a dark numerology that we're doing right now, arithmetic with infinity. But with that, we still get a little bit of a comfort with this. When you divide by infinity, that's gonna give you zero. So two minus zero gives you two. The improper integral is going to add up. This improper integral is 2. The area under this curve as you go from 1 to infinity is 2. It's quite fascinating that even though the length of the interval is infinite, the area under the curve is still a finite value. And we get this 2 right here. Now, some things I do want to mention about this is that properly, if you're going to be a proper improper integral, you should be using this limit notation. But frankly speaking, if most people are gonna feel more comfortable with the following, we're gonna do an improper, improper integral. We sort of recognize that, oh, when there's an infinity, that means we take a limit, even if we don't write that. Much like, what, what do we define this notation to mean? It means take a limit, okay? So, many of us are just gonna jump straight to the antiderivative. We get negative two x to the negative one half as you go from one to infinity. Some people have a spaz attack right now when they see this. It's like, what are you doing with infinity, right? What does that mean? Well, it means a limit. It means a limit, just like it did here. Why can't we do it there as well? In which case, then the next step looks like negative 2x, sorry, negative infinity to the negative 1 half uh, plus 2 times 1 to the negative infinity, a uh, negative 1 half right there. And so again, the people are still panicking. It's like, oh no, what's going on? You can't do arithmetic with infinity. Well, we kind of did already. We, we're used to doing that. And yes, what it means is this right here. So if we want to be completely proper, we're taking limits. And this is just supposed to be an abbreviation of a limit. So please chillax. Take a chill pill, right? Um, in which case, then you end up with 0 plus 2, which gives you 2 as well. So as we go through these calculations, I'm going to try this more simplified notation. But recognize, like in this one, you integrate from negative infinity to negative 2 here. This means... We're taking the limit as a approaches negative infinity here of the integral a to negative 2, 1 over x squared dx. That's what it means, but that full blown out of notation isn't really going to make much of a difference for us. We can, uh, we're going to prefer to use the abbreviation that I mentioned earlier. So if we integrate from negative infinity to negative 2, uh, well, let's look for an antiderivative. Um, I'm going to prefer to write this as a, as a power x and negative 2 to make it a little bit easier, in which case then the antiderivative will look like negative x and negative 1 as you go from negative infinity to negative 2. Or if you prefer, we can write this as negative 1 over x as your antiderivative as you go from negative infinity to negative 2. Like so, plugging in the numbers, you're going to get negative 1 over negative 2 plus 1 over negative infinity. And like we saw before, if you divide by infinity, I cannot draw infinity right now. When you divide by infinity, this is going to go to zero. And so we're left with uh, what looks like, oh, uh, which looks like uh, a one half, right? Uh, so we get one half as our final result right here. Um, as, a, as a third example, what happens if you want to go from negative infinity to infinity? In this situation, it really is important that you break this thing up. Go from negative infinity to 0, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, plus the integral from 0 to infinity, 1 over 1 plus x squared, like so. You do need to break it up because the thing is, if, you, if you're too careless with the limit notation here, you can actually get something that looks convergent that's truly divergent. So one has to be very careful about this. Now, it is the same function in both situations, 1 over 1 plus x squared. The antiderivative is going to be arctangent, arctangent of x, as you go from negative infinity to 0, and you add to that arctangent uh, as you go from 0 to infinity. Arctangent of 0 is itself 
zero. Um, as arc, arc tangent of infinity, what does one mean by that? Well, we're really looking for the horizontal asymptote as x approaches infinity on the right side of the graph. And then you're going to uh, subtract from this arc tangent of negative infinity, like so. And the, 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 the horizontal asymptote for arc tangent is going to be a pi over 2. And then you're going to, on the other side, it's going to be a negative pi over 2. And so this adds up to be pi, which is kind of fun, right? Uh, the area under the curve here is pi. Now, one thing I noticed is that as I proposed this slide, there's actually an example I skipped by mistake. I don't know how I did that. I didn't prep it beforehand. Uh, but I do want to, this is an important example to see here. Uh, let's do, uh, this will be example D. Let's do the integral from 1 to infinity of dx over x. So the important thing to recognize here is we want to integrate from 1 to infinity. It's an improper integral, right? Uh, so we have 1 over x dx. The antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log as you go 1 to infinity. But what happens this time as we plug in infinity? You get the natural log of infinity minus the natural log of 1, which the natural log of 1 is itself 0, so that'll disappear. So the area under this curve is whatever the natural log of infinity means, which, as we mentioned before, the natural log of infinity really means we're taking the limit as x approaches infinity of the natural log of x. So what happens to the natural log as x gets bigger, 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 bigger? This thing is going to go off towards infinity. So therefore, this is an example of a divergent, a divergent uh, improper integral. The other three examples that we saw were examples of convergent uh, integrals because we ended up with a positive number when we were done. Divergence is a possibility, and, and do be aware that if your integral turns out to be infinity, these improper integrals often turn out to be infinity. It is an example of a divergent integral because it doesn't converge towards a number. The area under the curve is, in fact, finite.